Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high quality website or blog. For a free trial and 30% off your new account for three months, head on over to Squarespace.com and use offer code FRAMERATE1. Wood. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm and we have a, Robert Young. You have just a Robert Young right over here. See, this is weird because I'm remote, and yeah. because I'm I'm under a sea of music, I could shout, and you only hear me barely bubbling out there, like. Rawr, 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 rawr. So that's why usually Tom takes that. But then, then again, like uh, Tom's not here, so I've got to pretend to be dad for a little bit. How you doing, Miss Sarah Lane? I'm doing great. I am. I am. I'm here for you to take on whatever you need me to take on. But really, you and Tom do the show so well that I'm just I'm just lucky to be sitting in his seat uh, when he's off this week. So thanks so much for having me. Uh, well, I was trying to think of like if there was, if I was to define Tom Merritt, it would be the professionalism of a Sarah Lane and the creative energy slash awesomeness of a Justin Robert Young. So we grabbed Justin Robert Young to join us as well. How are you doing, JRY? Uh, I, you know, I for one am glad that Tom was kidnapped by ninjas. You know, he was just <laughs> getting a little too sassy. So uh, I think maybe this. This journey into the underbelly of the triad is is what's good for him. Uh, and kidnapped by ninjas, you mean hanging out in Maui and complaining about how he wishes he was seeing his awesome friends in Oahu. But none of that is the big story. This is the big story. This just in, the big story. Analyst to studios, it's time to force early VOD on theater chains. Uh, this is an article that comes from paidcontent.org talking about the fact that it is time for everybody to get together and bully movie theaters into accepting the inevitability of high-priced day-of-release video-on-demand content. Uh, I actually think this is a brilliant, brilliant idea. Demand that they deb- that the same day they debut in theaters, charging consumers $20 to $25 for rentals, uh, the question, of course, being we already have people sneaking video cameras into movie theaters. What's going to happen when all of a sudden there's a way for them to make pristine pirated copies of the movies? And I think I don't think there's anything different from the question we already have with all the content that's currently on Netflix. What do you guys think about this? Well, I know, Brian, but in the past you've talked about you've got a family, you've got kids. Sure, going to the movie sounds like a fun idea, but it's a huge hassle. So much money involved, the concession stands, and and it gets to be really complicated that... Um, even to charge something above, you know, what a movie rental would be on iTunes or, you know, equivalent in a VOD setting would be worth it to you. So it's not just money, but it's also hassle. 
So last year, Warner Brothers, Sony, Universal, and Paramount all endured a series of threats and public rebukes, this is from the article, from the National Association of Theater Owners when they experimented with a VOD model that made movies like Just Go With It, available for $30, eight weeks after their theatrical debut. So this isn't even day of. This is eight weeks after, and they're still getting bullied around by the no, big boys. But but like, like, like Sarah said, uh, concessions are a huge thing, and concessions are, are what... Theaters can take home. Uh, 90% of what they charge for the opening couple weeks of a ticket goes to studios. The the house itself that you're going to see this movie in, uh, they make their money on everything you buy while you are there. And if you take away the incentive to go and sit in their chair where they can easily sell you these overpriced uh, foodstuffs, then that takes food out of their mouths. Now, I do agree with Brian. The question here is is inevitability. Eventually, this is going to happen. The question is when... And uh, for for the movie theaters, it's not like they have an out. I mean, a lot of these are not owned by huge conglomerations. It's not like they can diversify into areas where they can continue to make more money off of uh, you know movies that come out. So they're gonna they're gonna you know yell and scream because for for a lot of this, it's not like the VOD kills movie theaters, but it certainly is very you know, very much so giving up a part of the pie that they use to keep their doors open. Well, what about well, a movie well, here, like uh, Melancholia, which I saw via iTunes before it even was released in theaters? And I, it was, you know, it's a smaller studio, uh, but that movie, which is really good, got a lot of buzz with people who wanted to see it badly enough to download it, uh, you know, at their own accord. And it still did very well in theaters, critical acclaim. I, I don't know that that movie was hurt at all, even by it being available on demand before it was released in theaters. No, that right. that helps. That that absolutely helps for a movie like that. And for independent films, uh, Tim and Eric's movie uh, is being released on iTunes and VOD. And it actually might already be out uh, before it will be released theatrically. And I don't think that's going to hurt that specifically. What they are concerned with is... Pirates of the Caribbean 8, yet more pirates. And right. all Too the gigantic- many pirates. Yeah. <laughs> so- uh, enough with the pirates already. And and The Dark Knight and Avengers and all these movies that everybody lines up in theaters uh, for and buys popcorn and soda that okay, they can- so- well, Here's my question to you. You bring up the individual movie theaters. I'm going to suggest- that really the individual movie theaters are kind of completely irrelevant here. It's really just up to the studios. If the studios stand to make more money with $25 day of release video on demand, because think about it, their infrastructure is so much less. They don't have to, they don't have to get, I mean, we're moving beyond physical copies, but they don't have to worry about licensing deals. They're able to keep all of the money. Is it a case where the individual theaters, like who cares if the individual theaters uh, get screwed out of this thing? The, the, if the studios make money doing it, it seems like they're going to go ahead and do it. The, 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 it's really the question of a tested business model versus versus an untested business model. And yes, you can put up a lot of evidence to say that they're going to make a lot of money. Will it be the same amount of money that they can just get, that they can count on year after year after year, going to these movie uh, chains and selling their prints, or is it going to be less? They just don't know. And Hollywood is, of course, notoriously risk averse. And that's what we're seeing here. Eventually, this will happen. It's not and it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. But uh, it's going to be kicking and screaming with uh, you know both sides, really. Well, that, that's, that's the funny part to me is that they're worried about an untested business model. Meanwhile, by way of private, uh, piracy, we're having all kinds – we're having massive – tests on what is and is it possible to download movies by way of cable internet access. But that is another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. So we're talking about cable internet. 130,000 Time Warner cable subscribers go missing. To find them, you might ask Verizon and AT&T. This is an article by Peter Kafka over in All Things D talking about the fact that uh, Time Warner is seeing a big loss of subscribers and uh, suggesting that now he gives you two ways that you could read this. You could be from the cord cutter's perspective like, ha ha, suck on that, Time Warner. We're all cutting the cable and we're watching stuff by Hulu and Netflix. Or... If you look at it for uh, from the other side, what does he say here? He says that uh, that it could be the fact 
that uh, this is a case of AT&T and Verizon stealing market share from Time Warner Cable. Now, uh, I, I almost want to recuse myself from this story because, as you guys know, I'm exceptionally frustrated with my Time Warner Cable acts, uh, service right now. While historically they've been good to me, I'm so done with the with the Internet access. I'm done with the all-in-one bundling. I'm done with the... Uh, the poor customer service. Um, so I personally wish I was one of the 130,000 missing from Time Warner's cable subscribers. I, I, well, okay. So I also feel the same way. I'm, I'm such a Comcast hater uh, that I no longer pay for Comcast cable. And it's, you know, I have my own beef with them. I know I'm not the only one, but I have chosen to, uh, well, actually, you know, in, in a way, I could have gone satellite, but I didn't. Um, I don't have another cable provider alternative, at least where I live. So it's Comcast or it's nothing, um, unless I want to dish on my, uh, on my uh, roof, which I don't. So I went ahead and cut the cord. Uh, at those, some of these subscribers are clearly going that way. I mean, you have an OTA antenna, and all of a sudden you can watch the Super Bowl and the Golden Globes. And for a lot of people, they don't necessarily need too much more than network TV uh, for the big stuff. Then again, if AT&T or Verizon have better monthly packages or better internet if you're doing a bundle. That's really important to a lot of people. Um, that was, uh, it was a problem I still have with Comcast, who I still have to pay have, for. Have you given for... any thought to, have you given any thought to actually trying over the air antenna for HD content? That's what I'm doing. Wait, you, what do you use? Like, like you just have a random tuner? Do you, do you use a TV, uh, TiVo to DVR it? Uh, no, we haven't really gotten that far yet. I just bought something. It was like a $30. I think it was actually, it was from Radio Shack. I think it's actually a Radio Shack branded uh, digital con con converted. So, so you like watch TV just like whatever's on is what you watch. And if that's what happens to be on, then that's what you're looking at. That's adorable. Well, that's not really how I consume most of my content. I mean, I have an Apple TV. I have a Roku. Um, no. I, I use Amazon On Demand. Netflix. How about for live saying, stuff? I mean, this is this is always what I know for me. I'm always paranoid about being, you know, the, the cord cutting thing always terrifies me because I'm scared about losing the big cultural live moments like the Super Bowl, like the Oscars when they come up. And, and you know, I'll tell you what, I am so uh, in, intensely sick because I'm in Florida where the direct TV sunbeam thing, I, I, haven't, I haven't checked recently whether it's still going on. But they took Fox off my uh, off off Directv. What I have, and I am I'm incredibly frustrated with that. I think I'll tell you what this this over the air tuner thing because I I didn't even thought about it until all this thing happened, and I'm thinking about it more and more. It's really the 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 stuff that happens with all of these major providers is just kind of disgusting customer service wise, and it seems like it's a constant struggle. Uh, particularly as a DirecTV subscriber, that they're getting in fights with these uh, networks and stuff like that, that, uh, you know, these kind of situations happen. So uh, them giving market share to each other or losing market share doesn't surprise me at all. This is also it's, it's like, Time Warner Cable losing 129,000 subscribers is like 1%. I mean, they have over 11 million people subscribing still. So it's interesting. I sort of hope that the trend is is cord cutting and alternative uh, viewing options, but they still have a crap ton of subscribers. Right. Well, and that's the thing. Uh, part of the reason this is significant is because the histor historically the story's been everybody talks about wanting to cut the cord, nobody actually does it. So the whole reason this is even a story is because it's exceptionally rare that you would have a sizable number. Uh, leaving one one group at a time. Uh, and by the way, I should point out that the chat room, uh, Knox Herenting is pointing out that over-the-air HD is much, much better than anything you can get either from satellite or from cable. Have you noticed yeah. an increase of quality when you're watching live content? Uh, on my OTA antenna over cable? Yes. It's like yes. twice as good. So, so, so it's it's very visible. You just in, notally, instantly notice it. Yeah. I can... I, the, the only... When it's fine... It's amazing. If it's off a little bit, it's not as if the picture gets fuzzy or or murky or anything. It just gets janked. I mean, you know that you have to like tune the antenna a little bit. <laughs> that happens to me with NBC. But uh, but it's it's like it, when it it's either basically on or off. And when it's on, it looks much better than cable ever did. It, almost to the point where it's like, how is this only thirty dollars for one little antenna? No. Wow. Yeah. Now, That's now, awesome. now uh, re real quick, let me just point out with these cable systems. Uh, this is the exact same problem that studios have with theaters. And the reason why uh, networks don't just go and sell like it would be in their interest and some sports leagues do with packages, they don't just sell their content directly as a subscription to consumers 
uh, the via set top boxes like Apple TV or Roku or Boxy or something like that is because they already have X amount of people or X amount of revenue that comes in by signing deals, putting one signature down with all these different distributors. As people get more set top boxes and cord cutting becomes more of a thing, you're going to see, like the, the studios have with VOD, that eventually the tides will start to turn and we'll be able to just buy a la carte programming, which is what people have always wanted to do with cable and direct TV service forever. I cannot believe that you brought that up because that instantly segues into yet another big story. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. So how often has everybody talked about how badly they want to give up on all at once pricing? They're tired of, of the five so seconds ago. Five seconds ago. I was just right. talking about that. It's so crazy. You brought it's it so funny that we just lead right into this because it turns out, again, this is another All Things D, All Things D uh, article uh, titled, Like Sports on Cable? Well, then pay up. Don't like sports on cable? Pay up anyway. Talking about how we've already talked about this on Frame Rate, talking about what a huge percentage of money that you're paying for your cable bill goes directly to pay for sports only networks like your ESPNs, your ESPN2s, your NFL Network, Fox College Sports, and so on. Now that we are hitting 2012, we're able to look back at the fees collected for 2011, and guess what's on top? ESPN, ESPN 3D, NFL, ESPN2, Fox College Sports, and the NBC Sports Network. Uh, this is a weird, this might be a good moment to have a debate, because on the one hand, you got me, who could care less about sports. On the other side, you got Justin Robert Young, who would kill a man in order to find out one more sports statistic about some game or other. Where do you fall into this, Sarah Lane? I like uh, certain teams, and I like them to the death. So I don't follow all sports, but I want regular access to sports. NBA can jump off a cliff for all I care, but football and baseball are very important to me. Hockey, sure. So do you mind that whether you want it or not, uh, what we're going to say, what was it, about 20% of all the money that you pay to your cable network ends up going to sports channels? I don't know if that's right or not. I might be making that up. Yeah, the problem is that sports networks are not usually sports specific, which is the kind of thing that I'm more interested in. I mean, I would be interested in buying a football package, not a package that has like ESPN HD and ESPN3 and and and, and that kind of stuff. You know, I don't need the golf channel type of a thing. It it would be interesting to see something packaged that way or maybe um, something, a uh, cable subscription that was a lot uh, cheaper that uh, guaranteed that I would get to see playoffs and the Super Bowl or, you know, or the second half of the season or something like that. Of course, real fans would shake their heads and go, that's stupid. You would want the whole season no matter what. But it would be nice to have different options because there are different levels of sports people. I mean, people don't either love sports or hate sports. Sometimes they're interested but not necessarily every single game. Yeah, in the well, article, I mean, uh, in the article, I was going to say it breaks down the uh, sports by dollars out of the complete uh, out of the subscriber the affiliate fees. Uh, ESPN HD, ESPN five dollars plus per user. ESPN three D two dollars and seventy one. I'm more offended by it being 3D. The idea of $2.71 of my money going to a 3D network than anything else. NFL, another buck. ESPN2, another buck. Uh, broken down all by the individual uh, dollar amount. What were you going to uh, say, Justin? There's actually a very good reason why ESPN uh, particularly is the highest uh, you know, person on that list, and that's because they pioneered the concept of getting paid by cable providers to carry their programming. Previous to ESPN demanding that kind of... Uh, fee, uh, channels used to pay cable systems uh, to carry their signal. And they completely reversed that dynamic based on NFL programming that they got way back in the day. So uh, no. there is, I mean, just by being first to the dance and having a popular product, they've been able to kind of keep pace ahead of everybody else. So that's why ESPN is not necessarily, certainly sports are super popular and ESPN has done well to keep themselves uh, indispensable in the minds of many people who are on these cable packages. But uh, that's the reason why they are always the highest because they were the first to even ask. Now, I don't doubt for even a second that ESPN was first, and I don't doubt that they're not the best at uh, getting these affiliate fees. But but do they deserve it? Is this something that's required? I mean, if HBO was first to demand affiliate fees or any of the other ones, I mean, it's like it, it kills me 
that uh, I, I I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe I'm well, just it's, it's built it, wrong to understand the the sports ophelia that goes on. It, 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 it's a very simple uh, you know conundrum. Take away the programming and see how many people riot, and that is what your fee is going to be. You know, and and that's when when ESPN was charging fees and raising fees and a lot of what they've been able, they were able to secure the Monday Night Football rights based solely on the mathematical calculation that they would be able to charge X more to people on uh, to all these cable systems because they can now say, what are you going to do? Take us off and have everybody throw pitchforks at your face when their team's on Monday Night Football and you're going to go market by market for Comcast or Time Warner or something like that. Um, you know, and, and the cable but companies weren't willing just- to do it. That's just it. If they truly do have that kind of power, if they really do have that market share, why wouldn't they pull out of the system altogether? And instead of getting your measly $5 per uh, per affiliate, uh, go and, and do a Netflix type model where it's all you can eat sports. You can watch everything live. You get Sports Center right up to the minute and you pay 10 bucks a month. And the only answer I, I can come up with is because they love the fact that they get a bunch of people like Sarah who only have a couple of sh- sports that they care about and folks like me who could care less about sports, but but I'm still subsidizing them. You are. Um, But uh, I think it's funny you should mention that because I do believe that ESPN is probably closer to doing something like what you're talking about than almost any other channel. They've always been on the forefront of understanding new mediums and how to best do it. But it goes back to what we were talking about with the studios. It's known model versus unknown model, and nobody wants to make that jump and have it not work. No, I think that's I think that's a totally fair analysis because that's the reason we see uh, sequel philia throughout uh, the summer release seasons. Because all if there's one thing we know about Hollywood is they want known commodities that are definitely going to make bank, which is why you get Adam Sandler, Jack and Jill, and all that stuff. You got anything else to chime in on here, Sarah Lane? I think I think the 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 the, the shift this applies to sports as it applies to kind of anything else that people rely on cable to watch. If enough people stop buying into cable packages because it simply is not economically feasible and you can't do this with all sports, but you know you can you can buy uh you know the um uh NBL uh for a year and and watch baseball and you know it's blacked out and there are some restrictions, you know, if it's local type of thing, but this will get worked out eventually and when people can pay in other places then cable networks will have to uh, they'll have to lower fees. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right. Well, if that's all we have on that one, let's take a moment to thank our sponsors over at Squarespace. Justin, you ever hear of Squarespace? Uh, no, I never have. Ever. Oh, dude. Yeah, Sarah, you ever hear of Squarespace? These guys are fantastic. Yeah, are it's so me? funny. I actually have a Squarespace blog. I love Get it. Get out of town. Yeah. Because I was about to say, if you have a blog portfolio or any kind of website, they have fantastic looking templates to make you look totally professional and you can set up fast and easy websites that look completely awesome. And because they have distributed hosting, you can't be brought down when your site gets totally super popular. When it shows up on your digs or your reddits or your, your uh, CBS Evening News it will still stand there no matter what. What do you have on Squarespace, Miss Sarah? Well, uh, what do you mean? Oh, sarahlane.com. <laughs> it's just my personal <laughs> it's my personal blog. Yeah, I, what's nice what I like the most about Squarespace is that I don't actually blog that regularly. So instead of it just sitting there looking like, you know, it's kind of going back to nature and people say, "Ah, oh, she doesn't she doesn't even hang around here." I have a lot of little widgets that I have had plugged into my site. So, you know, you've got my latest tweet there. I was uh I was promoting uh, tech news today, um easy Twitter links to social networks, and then on my blog itself, which is which are places that I am updating regularly. My Flickr photos is another widget that I love. Um, and I've, I'm using like a nice custom layout here. So even though I don't always have time to blog, my site is always dynamically changing. Um, and that's really important to me because I am active online and I want my, my kind of personal uh, blog to reflect that. Uh, I think you nailed the best part is because by doing your regular social media thing by way of the widgets, it ends up automatically updating your website. So even if you don't pay attention to the website like mine, I haven't focused on in a couple of years, but my latest tweets show up, my latest Facebook updates, all that stuff. And the best part is if you head on over to squarespace.com, you could get a free two week trial and they don't ask for a credit card or nothing. Use promo code frameweight. 
frame frame weight. Frame weight. <laughs> that means wait patiently for the frame. Frame rate one, and you'll get, uh, I believe, let me make sure I'm understanding this correctly, 30% off your new account for three months. That's a lot of cash that you'll save. And, of course, you'll be keeping frame rate in business. Let yes. us dive into the slipstream. Uh, Amazon may be aiming for Netflix with a new streaming service. Now, this sounds kind of silly because you're like, I thought they already were taking on Netflix. We had the three golden triumvirate. You had Hulu, Netflix, and Amazon Prime, the shipping service that for some reason continues to make videos available. However, a uh, new article on CNET.com says that they may be looking to cut into Netflix's action by launching a new video streaming service. And, uh, on the specifics of this, let me see if I'm getting this exactly right. It looks like they are hinting at, no specifics, but they are hinting at a monthly subscriber fee to take on Netflix head-to-head. -head. Currently, right now, in order to get the Netflix Prime, you have to pay the $79 per year Amazon Prime subscription, which may be a big hurdle to people who might otherwise jump in because you pay all at once. When If you think about it, it's the same fee whether you pay what? $7 or $6 a month or $79 once a year. But it looks like uh, uh, net, it says here, Netflix is even anticipating the new video offering from Amazon in a letter directed to shareholders yesterday. Netflix said that, quote, we expect Amazon to continue to offer their video service as a free extra with Prime domestically, but also to brand their video subscription offering as a standalone service at a price less than ours. So uh, what do you say? You think they're going to you think they're going to try to take on Netflix head ahead? I think they're absolutely going to try to take on Netflix, and they might be really successful. I know, I, I believe Reed Hastings was quoted last week as saying, yeah, we, we expect them to do this. We're not worried because we have uh, the better library, which they do for now, uh, but I don't really anticipate that. I mean, as long as Netflix has a better library, they can say, yeah, Amazon's okay, but it's like the Kindle Fire to our iPad. It's not. It's apples and oranges. We have so much more. But well, that's 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 the thing that surprises me is because they've always Netflix, or Amazon Prime has always been kind of like third fiddle in the the video delivery business. It's always been one where it's like, well, I guess. I mean, it's free. You already you you bought Amazon Prime for the shipping. Might as well enjoy whatever content they have. But if I'm gonna if I'm gonna judge it head to head, even if it is a dollar cheaper per month, it's like I got to imagine Netflix has the uh, Netflix has the much much bigger library. Well, they well, do, I mean, and they're also getting into the original content business. Go ahead, Justin. No, no, no. Yeah, no. I think yeah, absolutely. Design a good UI first for Amazon Videos. The, their mm -hmm. UI on every platform is horrifyingly bad. Their search yeah. is terrible. You can never find any. I would love. I, I, I'm a happy Prime uh, subscriber, and I have been for years, but. To try and find stuff that I want to watch on Amazon Prime is horrifyingly bad. And that's one thing that Netflix, for whatever anybody can say about it, it's fa it's fairly good. I love my Apple TV UI. I think uh, the, the UI on the Xbox is fantastic. Uh, their their uh, search on uh, the website is good. You know, and, and they have leagues to go, Amazon would, before they catch uh, Netflix in that regard. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I just think... Do that. Make it usable, uh, what you have now, and then talk about taking on Netflix, which is dedicated to only that. Uh, speaking of Netflix, Netflix bows to Warner Brothers, creates four-week delay before allowing new releases in your queue. This is from Chris Welch over at The Verge. Um, it says they negotiate an agreement with Netflix, Redbox, and Blockbuster. Uh, essentially, you have to wait 28 days after the release, the physical copy release, to even uh, get the ability to put it into your queue. Uh, yeah, man. Wow. What? That's, That's so stupid. Uh, so what, if, what if you can put something... <laughs> All right. Uh, I have cues that I don't get to, stuff in my queue that I don't get to for at least 28 days. Why not at least allow me to add a placeholder... Yeah, that's and, if, and for whatever reason, on the day that I decide I want to stream this movie, it's not 28 days later. It gives me a little something saying, you have three days left or something. If they were going to remake 28 Days Later and release it on DVD, how long would I have to wait to put it on my Netflix queue? 37 weeks is apparently <laughs> the answer. Uh, I'll tell you, man, I got to wonder if they don't have some kind of like uh, weird work around on this i can see them doing uh, my guess is it's in the agreement that they don't have some kind of like set a reminder offer that you could do but uh but that's that's insane to me that um, i mean again 
If there's one but, thing that we make clear on frame rate is we don't understand the insanity of of this business. Well, but I mean, there, there's Warner Brothers and then there's Netflix uh, in this in this deal. Warner Brothers wants more protection for their physical media DVD sales. Netflix wants library, and so that's why this deal is met. Uh, you know, because they see over their shoulder people like Amazon coming, and and they realize that 2011 was not exactly a banner year when it came to subscriber uh, loyalty. So. Uh, you know, they, they will make any deal. Now is the time, if you are in bed with Netflix, to demand whatever you want from them because, yes. because they will make any deal to bolster their library. No matter how irrational it may be or unfair. Uh, the, from the chat room, I think they nailed it. Mukau in the chat room says uh, uh, third-party workaround, and I think you're going to see a lot of that. There's going to be – I'm surprised we're not seeing more apps on your desktop for managing – uh, Netflix, where it's like, you know, because they have this rotating library of different titles available, surprised that it can't take what you like and then like send you alerts when certain movies come into rotation that you've said before that you like or would be interested in watching. NFL Super Bowl. How many of you guys are going to watch the Super Bowl? Me. Me. Justin. Do well, you care? I don't know. It depends on whether or not it's on during game on. Strangely I enough, won't. I will not be because I don't really care who put what ball through which apparatus. But I'm in the minority. And for the first time ever, 2012 will be the first time that you can live stream the Super Bowl. Do you guys care? Are you going to watch it live stream or are you going to watch it over the air? No, I'm going to watch it over the air. That's why I bought that darn $30 antenna. Actually, it was to watch the Golden Globes that night. But the Super Bowl <laughs> is just its just the icing on the cake. But uh, I like the idea. I didn't have an antenna just three weeks ago. And it would have been really nice to have that as an option. They're, yeah. or, or, you know, let's say you're traveling. Let's say you're stuck at the airport. It's, you know, or you're at the, I was going to say DMV, but you're probably not there on a Sunday. But there are a lot of places that you might be stuck where you'd love to have something like this. And last year you didn't have the option. And this year you do, legally. We should. Let, we should let, let's out. say you're breaking into the DMV on a Sunday night trying to steal public <laughs> records. So, it's yeah, nice so you might not be having purple. that much fun. That's just <laughs> not a fun thing to do on a Sunday. You need the oh. car. You can head over to NBCSports.com and watch a live stream of the Super Bowl for the first time. Uh, the online offering won't simply be a mirror of the TV coverage. This is according to TechRadar.com. Uh, those who choose to watch on the web will get the benefit of multiple camera angles and the ability to rewind and pause the action. Well, that's, I mean, that's that's not really a feat. I mean, that's built into any online stream. You can always rewind on the buffer. No, no, I, I will I, I will say that uh, NBC has always offered this. They have the premier game of the week on uh, Sunday nights, and uh, they have always been very, very forward about uh, pushing people to the website to watch their live stream, making people aware of it. And uh, I've done it a couple times where I've just not been around a television. I wanted to kind of check in on the game, so I popped it up on my on my laptop, and it's a very good it's a very good product. You know, the resolution is fantastic and they're, uh, you know, they, they, they seem committed to it. So I applaud NBC for obviously taking this to the biggest stage possible. Yeah. Uh, analyst blasts pricing on Paramount disc-free UV movies. This is talking about ultraviolet. Uh, essentially, let me see if I can get the name of this correct. This is from uh, homemediamagazine.com. It's talking about uh, Frost and Sullivan analyst Dan Rayburn writing on his blog at streamingmedia.com utterly trashes the pricing model that they're using for ultraviolet. Specifically, he says that it's outrageous that the fighter from 2010 is available in high definition for, uh, what, $20, $23, for the fighter from a year and a half ago, $17 for standard definition, $20 for Braveheart, which is 17 years old, and Roman Polanski's Chinatown from 1974 starring Jack Nicholson is 20 freaking dollars. He says that this is outrageous and that you uh that this is an untenable model and that they've got to reconcile this pricing model with the fact that we live in a world where people are accustomed to seven dollar all you can eat netflix instant streaming or two dollar purchasing movies from uh from itunes what do you guys say about this is this something they're gonna have to wake up and smell the ultraviolet rays very much so the fighter is on netflix instant streaming right now so yes uh, that's a no-brainer, but yeah, okay. Let's say that you're the kind of person... I sort of liken this to people who want to buy music and have it in their own libraries rather than pay a, uh, a monthly fee to have streaming music in the cloud. Um, 
but the but the but the issue is is that uh, with music right now it's kind of a toss up. It's like, well, you know, I might not listen to that much music, so I just want to buy an album every once in a while or track by track, that kind of thing. Or if you're the kind of person who consumes a lot of music, you really get more out of a streaming music service because you can just listen to music all day and, and and discover a lot of new artists. So it's almost a little bit of a wash. It's like, well, just pick your habit. There's a there's there's a a plan that's best for you. This is like just ridiculous. I mean, the prices are totally, they're, they're wackadoodle insulting. Um, well, and, and I don't know why anybody not, would buy into it. It's it's like not only are they full retail, but they're full, full retail without any physical media. We know that the media costs something. At least give us a nod to that and knock off, you know, go ahead and tell us the lie that the media costs you a buck ninety to create and then make us feel good by not by buying the digital version and paying you know a dollar ninety less, the way it is right now, you're paying full retail. I don't even pay full retail for the physical media that I get. Usually, I wait till it's on sale, or you buy it online somewhere where somebody's willing to take a hit on it. Yeah, um, for these prices, just, I, I want I want like Eddie Vedder to come over and have dinner with me <laughs> <laughs> and play his ukulele record. Yeah, then I'll I'll buy that new documentary for forty five dollars. Uh, it's just, it's not even doesn't even make sense to make fun of this, you know. It, it, it's so wrong headed and so stupid, it'll be dead tomorrow. Now, now, keep in mind, keep in mind, what I'm saying is I actually do believe in Ultraviolet as a platform. I think if they get their, their act together, if they understand, what I like about Ultraviolet is that it models the best parts of Steam's, uh, of, of Valve's Steam-powered software, uh, where you could have your games available to you anytime, anywhere. But the reason Steam is such a success is because they understand that digital distribution allows them flexibility to do things like their outrageous Steam sales, where all of a sudden a game that's normally 20 bucks is suddenly available for $3.49, but only for a limited time. If they did that with movies, think about this. What if they had the retail cost of all these different movies, and then periodically, let's say The Machinist went on sale for 3 bucks? It's like, dude, I'd so buy The Machinist again for $3. Our prices are like Christian Bale's body weight. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That means <laughs> that means Batman would be very expensive. But it's like I'd so be down for that. It's only, The problem is they're only copying half the model that works. And what they need to understand is that with the flexibility of digital distribution comes the ability to drive demand with a scattershot of sales. And that certainly has worked for Steam. I can't believe... They haven't modeled that on uh, ultraviolet at all. Uh, all right. If that's it for that, then I guess we'll move on to Tube Talks. <laughs> Apple TV selling well despite being a hobby. This is from Fierce Online Video. Uh, let's see if we could get the specifics of it. In the last fiscal year ended in September, we sold a bit above 2.8 million units of the Apple TV, and that was just in the past quarter. The December quarter, we set a new quarterly record for Apple TV with over 1.4 million units. Sarah Lane, did you buy an Apple TV? I have three Apple TVs, uh, and it's a long story why that is the case, um, but two of them I use regularly in two different rooms. I love my Apple TVs. Um, now Part, part of the reason I love them so much is AirPlay because it's not only, yeah. as Justin said, the Netflix interface on Apple TV. I prefer it to the Roku interface. I could go either way. But the Apple TV one is nice. I like the interface. You know, you can drag stuff off of your home network. But my AirPlay capabilities, I use that thing all the time. I sit with my iPad in my hands and when I have AirPlay capabilities, even like well, when I, I'm reading Spin Magazine because they have an iPad edition, they have little interviews with the artists and I can send it to my TV and watch it on the big screen instead of sort of holding it in my couch. Love AirPlay. Apple TV is worth $100 just for that. Now, are you I, using the one that's designed for streaming only, right? You don't have, or do you still have the older ones that had hard drives inside? Uh, streaming only. Okay. What about you, Justin? Yeah, that was that was the cheap one. That's like it was like ninety nine dollars. I have it. I use it every single night. Uh, I it was the reason why I stopped paying money uh, to the NHL through my cable system or Direct TV system. I now buy it directly through uh, their uh, online package directly through. At my Apple TV, the Netflix thing is amazing. And like Sarah said, AirPlay is the reason to get it. I mean, I understand. I have a couple friends of mine that are like diehard Roku people. I, I used to own a Roku. I actually just gave it to my brother happily as a as a uh, part of his Christmas present for him to enjoy all the awesome things that Roku does. But for me, AirPlay is it. I love it. I, I'll buy. I bought the Red Letter Media app 
just so I could airplay stream their Kingdom of the Crystal Skull Plinket review on my television. And it was super simple. It is it is one of those magical elements of technology that I can't live without. Yeah, there was a, a recent trip I took overseas. I had downloaded a bunch of movies um, that I had that I had rented on um, iTunes. I didn't get to all of them. I just was in the mood on the plane or I was sleeping or something. When I get back home, it's like, oh, I've got some time left on this stream. And it's it's just, it's almost like, how is this really looking so good when it's just coming from my from my, uh, from my iPad? From the phone. Yeah. yeah. Here, here's no. my question. Because I, I look at this, I look at the sales success of this, and I'm so confused by Apple's uh, repeated insistence that this is a hobby. No matter how good or how, how bad Apple TV, TV does, Apple almost denounces it. And it's very confusing to me. Even as they come out with new versions of it, they're like, oh, it's just a hobby. It's just a hobby. Uh, I mean, obviously, we know that an Apple TV, a physical TV is coming out. Uh, do we think that all of this is just a proof of concept? Is the whole purpose of the Apple TV to work out bugs so that eventually when they release a set-top full-on television that they can put all of the best elements of the Apple TV into it? Yeah, I guess so. I, the The idea of having it within a television is just you don't have that set-top box that goes uh, right next to it. Personally, I am not in any hurry. It's not as if it's taking up a whole lot of space. doesn't really bother me. I mean, I, I like the idea of it all being integrated into one TV. I mean, it's not as if I'm not excited about whatever the future of Apple TV, whatever it is. But, uh, but yeah, it's not as if I think, boy, AirPlay is great on Apple TV, but there's so many other things it gets wrong. It sort of just seems like it's the next logical step to put it inside the TV somewhere. So you yeah. think it's going to be... Eventually, like a transparent UI, like that'll be your user interface and, and everything available will be streamed instantly to it. I'm sorry, what was that, Justin? I would say my only problem, and I don't know if, if, if other DirecTV, uh, or sorry, Apple TV people have the same thing. My number one problem with Apple TV is turning it on. Whenever I switch from my cable to like HDMI 1 to HDMI 2, like, I'll just click my button a million times before it turns on. So I would love it inside a television if it would just, when I switch it, do it, yeah, when it's just transparent and awesome, and I can just hit a button, and all of a sudden, everything I want to airplay is airplaying. All right, let's move on to Film Film. Tube tops is, of course, when we talk about the technology that sits atop your set-top box. Uh, but then Film Film is where we talk about what is played on your tube tops. So it's Tube Tops Film Film. So uh, obviously what dropped, uh, I don't know about you guys, the thing I'm most excited about is the Game of Thrones Season 2 Shadow Tease came out. It's about a minute long. Uh, do you have that queued up, Jason? Can we yeah, take a look I at it? Yeah, let's, do. Uh, let's play it here. There we go. Three great men. A king, a priest, and a rich man. Between them stands a common sellsword. Each great man bids the sellsword kill the other two. Who lives, who dies. Power resides where men believe it resides. It's a trick, a shadow on the wall. And a very small man can cast a very large shadow. Fighting to overthrow a king. Killing you would send your brother a message. You might find it difficult to rule over millions who want you dead. I am Daenerys Stormborn, and I will take what is mine with fire and blood. Anyone can be killed. Do you understand the way this game is played? Justin Robert Young is in a unique position to comment on season two of Game of Thrones because you've di dived in, you dived in full force to the books after seeing the first season, right? Uh, somewhat correct. I didn't watch all of the first season. I just started reading the books. <laughs> I can't believe you never finished watching the first season. You're insane. Uh, not not because I didn't like it, uh, because I made a, a, a blood friendship pact with uh, my friend Andrew Main uh, that we would watch them together and then we both kind of got really busy with other stuff and we just haven't kind of restarted where we picked up or we lost the track. But oh, I'm so excited. I'm, uh, it's, just, it's one of those things where like, I just read the second book. So like, I know I'm like, oh, but that's, oh, and he's talking about, and they're doing, oh, look, oh, that's gonna be great. So I don't know, I'm so <laughs> thrilled. 
Uh, did did you, Sarah Lane? Did you watch any of the season one of Game of Thrones? Oh no, I'm not able to because I don't have HBO, and HBO shows don't come to iTunes till like hundred years after they're <laughs> on HBO, and I can't actually- use the HBO Go app on my TV because I don't have a cable subscription. That is actually a way good point. So for you, like for me, already being on the regular cable train, it was like, all right, what's another 15 bucks a month? I'll fine, I'll get your HBO to add it. But for you, you would have to subscribe to cable altogether. So you're talking about 80 bucks a month in order to take the leap, in order to just watch one series. I know. It's it's absolute horse pucky. If anything makes me crazy, it's... I mean, this applies to Showtime, too, but there are just a lot of shows on HBO that, I mean, I would pay. I would pay more than than I should, even, because I really want to see the show. I have not seen the show. It, I haven't it, seen one minute of the show. Would you would, pay, would five, you pay five, five bucks so, an episode, Sarah? That's what I just said. Wow. Nice. From... Probably not. I'd probably just wait and complain because that's in my nature. But <laughs> I'd be, I'd pay well whatever a season pass would be. Yeah, I'd pay you know a third more than that to get it early. I don't know. I I know HBO's got it. You know, it's it's tied up in in its relationships with with um with cable providers. But it, it just makes me crazy um, that people like me would you know we want to pay. Um, you know, I'd pay a premium, but for whatever reason we can't because we don't want to pay for all that other junk. Uh, well, and, and, and eventually, Thrones. yeah. I mean, eventually, then this is going to be a, a thing that you know will will change at some point. It's not going to be now, but I mean, I guess the question is, what are we as consumers willing to pay, and when will HBO try this? With let's say, I mean, Game of Thrones is gonna, always going to be something that they're going to hide behind the wall because it's critically acclaimed, it's a hit, yada yada yada. But let's say the David Milch series, Luck, which is critically acclaimed but but is not going to tend to appeal for a live audience when will they put one of those outside the wall and say hey itunes people if you pay something it'll be ridiculous it'll be like five or six dollars an episode what kind of success will we have with that and that going forward well again we'll begin to build the evidence of what this new business model could be for hbo which right now they're staunchly against Game of Thrones coming on April 1st, which at first I was like, why would you pick that date? And then I realized April 1st is a Sunday. And so, of course, it's got to be on. uh, Oh, you mean because people will think it's a joke? It's not really happening on April 1st. It's synonymous. April 1st, especially when you live on the Internet. Internet, it means you can't trust anything with with the April 1st deadline on it. Uh, Walking Dead coming back. Do we have a little... Little thirty second teaser here of Walking Dead. Really, really quick, guys. Um, before before we do that, I have to I have to duck out of the show. I'm so sorry. Get out of here. Get out of here, Sarah Lane. I'm sorry That's I wasn't I, able uh, to stay till the end. Um, if you want to know ahead of time what I'm watching right now, um, just finish the third season of Friday Night Lights, and oh, that show is such a soap opera. But I'm hooked. Okay, it bye. is a soap opera. It really okay. is. Wow. By the way, that's okay because Jason Howell will, will stand in for you when we talk about what we're watching. <laughs> Yay. Actually, well, <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. I'm sorry I had to leave Thank early. You, Sarah. Uh, but Bye, thanks Sarah. so much for having Before me on the Sarah. show. All right. Let's Run take a look on. at the Walking Dead. All right. Here we go. Walking Dead. There is no hope. And you know it now. This February. Don't miss the return of the scariest show on TV. We all know this is not going to end well. The Walking Dead returns Sunday, February 12th at 9, only on AMC. Ugh. All right, I'm going to let Justin go first because I've got comments about this. What do you think? Um, i such a fan of The Walking Dead, the first season, man. I thought, I, I didn't just think it was a good show. I thought it was an important show. Like, right. I, I'm not a gigantic horror fan, but I do enjoy horror. And I know I have a lot of f- uh, friends who are just massive, just like horror dudes who go and see intensely crappy horror movies just because they love the genre. And I was so excited that an important and well done uh, you know, horror series had finally come to television. And all of that enthusiasm was completely drained as the first part of the second season unfurled. And at this point, like between that and their weird for God, no goddamn reason, hiatus uh, has just 
Okay, it's, it's not for no reason, though. Their hiatus, I think, was a very important opportunity to reset. I think they had severe problems with the whole Darabont issue and the fact that they knew that they lost a bunch of momentum in the first few episodes. I think they knew they needed to punctuate, so they picked a moment like, where can we break, regather, recoup, get our head on straight, and then get back to the quality people expected from the first season. I'm still But, but it's, not, it's not like they reshot stuff. It's not like they went back and said, like, oh, my God, wait a minute, this all sucks. Let's go do it again. Like, they just no, no, no. stop. But it can be that they look at the footage they have. They look at the episodes they have. They're like, okay, this whole section sucks. We're going to run it, and then we're going to take a break, and then we're going to come back and hit them again from a new starting point. I, and first of all, you're talking to somebody who gave up three times on Lost because of these different slumps when I went from watching it straight in a row to watching it week to week. And the second season was genuinely bad on Lost, but they came back, and... I'm optimistic that they have an opportunity here to come back with the second half of the second season. I think, I think they had a big enough I problem agree. that it was important they take a break. Uh, well, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I can go so far as to defend the hiatus. But I will say Lost is a great example. Specifically, the first half of season two and, this, and the first half of season three were bad. They were bad and boring and stupid. And what they did very, very well in season two, you got introduced to the Ben Linus character, Henry Gale, as he was called at the beginning. And season three, uh, I forget what the what the big kick-up moment was, but you had another game-changing kind of thing that really put the season into high gear, which made it awesome. But for every one of those, you just, I mean, I just have some, there's just a little word, Bri. It's just whispering in my ear. It's just, heroes. Uh. Heroes. <laughs> heroes. So you think you think it's all right. Well, maybe it does have heroes, but uh, you know what? Hopefully won't uh, suck the way the last seasons of Heroes did is uh, Iron Sky. We Of course, this is the Internet's movie. Every so often, this is what, the 2011, 2012 version of Snakes on a Plane? Iron Sky is actually coming out. We actually have the latest trailer that drops. Looks like it's coming out any minute now. Can we look at that? Yeah. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, the day we have been expecting is fast drawing near. Oh, Whilst we've been course. going about our respectable lives, uh -oh. those with sick and depraved minds have been building their armies and constructing their story. A preposterous story that will attempt to redefine history and dazzle the world with mind-blowing special effects. What is this device? Oh, that's my uh, kick-ass computer. That is not a computer. This it's a computer. I right. think you know what I'm talking kill it, kill it, about. Kill it. There we go. I think I think right then it drops an F an MF on the in the trailer. But uh if you watch the, the premiere trailer here, I guess it's coming out on February eleventh. Uh Iron Sky has looked over the top from the very wow. beginning. But this is the first of the previews that I think really showcases the over the topness of it. It's sort of this is where it's going self referential, and I'm actually way excited. I'm more excited now seeing this trailer than I have been about any of the other silly ones before it. Hello, everybody. My name is Timo. Justin. Um, so I have a bunch of Nazis flying around space. I've actually seen nothing about this. Wait, you haven't? The whole idea no. is that Nazis left Earth during World War II. They've been hiding out on the dark side of the moon. And now, in modern day, they're going to turn around and come back to totally bring back the Fourth Reich to take over, take over the world. I can't believe you haven't seen any of the Iron Sky stuff. It's been all over the place. Uh, no, 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 I haven't. Um, so, but is it, is it supposed to be like farcical or is it like, like, uh, like Sky Captain in the world of tomorrow? All of the previous ads for this, all the previous trailers have been playing it straight. Like, uh, and it, they've all been over the top, but this is the first, like you hear from the narration where they, they clearly are acknowledging that it's over the top and, uh, in they're premiering it in Germany, which I don't know if that's tasteful or distasteful. I can't really tell, but it's, um, uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by, by this whole experience. I'm way excited about it. Well, you know, it's again, you, know, you mentioned snakes on a plane. The reason why, Snakes on a plane, we were all in love because we all love Sam Jackson and we love Sam Jackson saying crazy stuff. Um, the Snakes on a Plane didn't do well because Snakes on a Plane sucked. <laughs> you know, so if this is good, then this will be great. I mean, like, I would love to see a great movie with space Nazis. All right. Well, if you've never seen any of the previous 
any of the previous trailers, just search for Iron Sky. You'll see it. You'll see the one where they've got the uh, the, the kids in elementary school and learning why they went to the moon and all that stuff. Um, but, uh, oh, you know what? Hey, this is totally a self-aggrandizing, you know, fist bump to ourselves here. But last week on NSFW, you and me showed a little video of a kid uh, screwing up at a... I'm going to go ahead and preload it here so I can jump to the right part. Screwing up at a spelling bee. Uh, that kid is going to be on Jimmy Kimmel. Did you hear about this, Justin? Uh, no, I, I, did, I did see that in his YouTube comments, the Jimmy Kimmel folks were trying to get in touch with him. But, uh, you know, I'll tell you what, maybe he needs to come and, and say hello to the the, the, the guys that, that, that put him up there, you know? And we didn't get him on an SFW show. Let me make no pretense about this. This clip was handed to us. We did a viral video tournament last week on an SFW show. When it came to us, it had like 20,000 views, and we blew it up. And next thing we know, it's on Reddit. And now uh, it's over. It's coming up on a half million views. And it's a kid who can't hear this chick at a, uh, at a spelling bee. Listen to this. Here we go. Please give me the definition. A wading bird that has a long neck and legs, a long tapering bill with a sharp point and sharp cutting edges, large wings, and soft plumage. May you please repeat the word? Heron. Uh, may you please use it in a sentence? <laughs> if Gail had not seen the heron fly down from the tree, she would have insisted that the huge bird nested on the ground. May you please repeat the word? Heron. What's the word again? Heron. Hair wink? Heron. Hair row? Heron. Hairline? Heron. Hurling? Heron. Maybe speak the word? Heron. Real? Heron. Herring? Heron. Herring. Heron. Herring. Heron. 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 Please. Heron. Please give me the definition. Oh, my God. <laughs> a wading bird that has a long neck and legs, a long tapering bill with a sharp point and sharp cutting edges. Heron. H-E-R-O-N. Heron. <laughs> okay. So uh, the, play the, the, next, play the, that, uh, the next word. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. No, yeah the, next, the next word is a pretty sweet moment. <laughs> Aptitude. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the case, the story goes that the speakers were faced away from the folks uh, sitting there, so they weren't able to they weren't able to really hear anything or follow along. So uh, that's the story for that. But um, it's kind yeah, of awesome. People were saying in, people were saying in the chat room like, "Oh, he's hard of hearing. Stop making fun of him. He's deaf. He's not deaf." The 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 and the reason why this video didn't blow up is because he talks for a minute up front. So, like, that's been there forever. That video has been, it's old, but he talks yeah. for so long up front that you, you can't get you to the money to shot it. right there, which is what you saw. All right. So, we're running short on time. You always want to jump in what we're watching? What we're watching. All right, Justin, what are you watching? Well, you know, I'll take, I'll, I'll take up Sarah's banner and talk about uh, Friday Night Lights. Um it's on Netflix, I do believe. I think you guys have talked about it before because Tom watched it. But uh, I'll just say pro tip here for anybody who gets into it. Do yourself a favor and take the second season with a grain of salt uh, because it's fairly terrible and short for a lot of really good reasons. But uh, if you can get to season three, seasons three, four, and five were after they went to Netflix, or sorry, not Netflix, to DirecTV, co-financed with NBC, and really started taking what was already a good network drama and producing it like a solid hour-long HBO-style uh, piece of television art. And uh, it's an amazing show. If you have not watched it, you really should watch it. Uh, it, it always got knocked as being like people who like quiet, well-done, super great character drama were like, I don't like football. And people who like football are like, I don't like talking. 
And so it, we just sort of <laughs> fell to this, um, you know, a, a, a very weird, uh, you know, part of the Venn diagram of those two. But it's well worth watching. Everybody should check it out. Yeah, and I'm actually glad you brought that up because I noticed I was watching uh, the tweets and I noticed that one Jason Howell announced that he was going to begin to begin <laughs> the big uh, Friday Night Lights challenge. What? what how yeah. far into it are you, Jason? Um, so it, this is practically the only thing that I'm watching uh, that we're watching lately. And we just started it a few nights ago. I think we're like five or six episodes into the first season. And yeah. it, you know, it, you know, so far I'm so far I, I'm fine with it. I have heard that the second season is not that great, um, and I've had some people on Twitter, to, you know, say just skip the second season and go right to the third. I always have a hard time just doing that. Like it's hard yeah, for me to block out an entire chunk of a show that I want to be a completist about. You know what I mean? So sure. It's hard well, for me to I, do that. I would say just understand that what happened was Directv was barely renewed past the first season because it didn't get great ratings. And so between that and the writer strike, where they had to write an extraordinary uh, amount and they were late in getting started because they didn't know whether or not they had jobs because NBC had yet to renew the show. Uh, and the fact that NBC was like, OK, guys, we really like this whole real emotions thing about a small town dynamic. But can you jazz it up a little bit? Let's get some crazy stuff going on here. Uh, and so they added a lot of really over the top things that I don't want to spoil. But mm. when you watch the pilot, you're like. Really? We're, we're doing this show now? Um, don't worry, though. Yeah, It's very short. It was cut down by the writer's strike. And uh, eventually it gives a lot of opportunity to, uh, to, to take the story in another direction, which if you liked, I will say this, if you liked The Wire and the element of The Wire where no character is safe and that you can turn over the entire cast, basically. If you look at the cast of the first season and the cast of the last season of Friday Night Lights, with a few exceptions... The majority of the cast is completely different, and the show doesn't suffer at all. Oh, so, interesting. Uh, that is that is pretty awesome. I mean, it does kind of feel like a teenage soap opera to a certain degree in some ways. Um, so that you know, there have been a couple of episodes where I'm kind of like rolling my eyes, like, uh, I, am I really sitting here watching this right now? But overall, I would say since we started watching it every night. We end up down in front of the TV, and it's like, well, do you want to watch another episode? Okay, sure. You know, so um, it it has that pull, which I think a good show or a good series like that does, especially when it's on some place like Netflix, where where it's like a smorgasbord, and you have the entire series ahead of you, and you you can act on that impulse to just watch them one after another. And Dude. that's so far that's that's doing it. I just fear the second season, but I'm happy to hear about the rest of the show. We'll stick with it and see how it uh, turns out for sure. I, I swear to God, you're gonna be. You're going to be just being getting all crazy about my frozen face and how excited <laughs> you are about, about Dylan football. You're, and I'll tell you, it has one of the best, it has the distinction of having one of the best pilots I've ever seen um, and a just a fantastic, like completely universe exploding season finale in season, the season three finale pretty much blows up the show in a way that you're like, and I'd be very if I actually had the option to watch the premiere of season four right after I watched season three, it might be the fastest that right. I've ever moved on anything ever. Just because you're like, what? What is he going to do now? What's going to happen? Good. I look forward to so, it. So uh, we finished watching Avatar The Last Airbender. And in fact, it was funny because uh, Justin came over to my place. We were recording uh, Night Attack 2 and... Uh, I guess the first thing that that uh, that you saw was like the last episode of the entire series, and so Again. everything is all the actions over the top. All, everything is totally huge and big and totally epic. And then uh, we went back, and Penny wanted to start it again at the very first episode, where everything's very small and and quiet and and very humble beginnings. Uh, after we finished it, though, Penelope was like, "Hey, what's another series we can watch together?" And I went through this list. I was like, "Cowboy Bebop," and Bonnie's like, "No, to adult." I'm like, Samurai Champloo? She's like, no, to adult. And then uh, uh, there were two or three other ones. And then finally I'm like, Star Trek The Next Generation? And Bonnie's like, yes, you can watch that with your daughter. So we started watching Star Trek The Next Generation. But I couldn't even bring ourselves, I couldn't bring myself to start anywhere in the first season. So I just picked a random one in the middle of the second season, which is where we're starting now. We're going to Why didn't you want to start it at the beginning of the first one? Because the first season's terrible, and none of the characters act like the characters, and everything's crazy and upside down and all over the place. So figure started. If Riker doesn't have a beard, it's not worth watching. And that goes for the <laughs> movies as well. Think about it. 
You make a very a very salient point. All right, it's time for feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. Michael writes us saying, hello, I wanted to get your feedback on something. Some movies are sold as a three-pack of Blu-ray, DVD, and digital copies. How do you guys feel about breaking up the three-pack? For instance, if I buy a Disney movie and keep the Blu-ray, give the DVD to my daughter's grandmother, and give the digital copy disc to a friend, is that kosher? All parties would keep their respective discs permanently. Even better, or parentheses, or worse, what if I sell the various discs? Uh, this uh, is from Michael. This is uh, continuing our theme of what's legal versus what's ethical. I'm going to say... It's totally ethical because you only have Legal. one thing to go around. Plus, if you think about it, Apple's already hip to the fact that people are doing that. You know, I use my one Apple account for my iPhone, for my wife's iPhones, for two iPads, and for the Apple TV. They Because you get up to five devices to watch things on, it's sort of built in. They want it to be one kind of one family. Take picture kind of your circle to share it around in. As long as it's limited to that, I think it's totally legal and totally ethical. Um, the only thing that I would say legally is I'm unsure exactly what, what the resale rights are, but I think that might only be if, if you're claiming it's new or whatever. So I think it's, my gut is that it's legal and ethical. If they're selling you three discs, then do what the hell you want with those three discs. You know, as long as you're not uploading it to the internet and, you know, posting it, then I think you can, you can give it to your mom, give it to your mama. See if I can. (laughs) Jason, what about you, man? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I if you buy a book, you know, a, a three pack of a book, and you give uh, one of the books to three different people, I personally see nothing wrong with that. So then, take it into this situation. I think it's, I think it's fine. Personally, all right. This but one comes from is. Scott in Des Moines, Iowa. Says Brian and Tom, after watching your show this last spring and seeing how excited you were for Game of Thrones and HBO, I decided to listen to all 193 hours. Of the Song of Ice and Fire audiobooks. It took six months, but I did it. George R. R. Martin is amazing. Roy Dotrice is the man. The world, the characters, and the scope of the story are incredible. Time to get caught up on the HBO series before season two starts. I really enjoy your show and insights. Keep up the great work. Now, excuse me while I try to find my Dark Tower series CDs. Scott from Des Moines. Uh, yeah, so I guess I guess uh, he could relate totally with you, Justin, going through the exact yeah. same thing. Yeah. Now, are you going to hold off on Song of Ice and Fire until after you watch season two so you can feel like you're kind of caught up with the the television visuals? Or are you just, you're in it full force. You're going to plow forward. Man, hell no. Nah. <laughs> uh, no, I'm I'm in it, man. I'm listening to everything that, that, that George R. R. Martin has to say, and that's pretty much all I care about. I want to I wanna know what happens to all these characters. I'm, I'm totally in love with the universe. And you know what? The thing that's different, for me, uh, and and so unique to his writing is his pacing, and I think that that's yeah. it's it just it's so and, and I I can't say what the experience is reading it, but I know listening to it, uh, you just really get a sense for like, you know, just the the ebbs and flows. And once I was very anxious listening to the first book, um, about like, come on, what's gonna happen? And it's like I just I, I had a, I had a pacing in my head that was not compatible with where he wanted to tell the story. And I was just like, okay, well, you know, what is Daenerys going to fight Robert? You know, uh, right, like, is that going right. to happen in the next two paragraphs? Cause I want it. And, uh, eventually you just surrender to his pacing. And you're like, you're just a wash in the lazy river of George R. R. Martin's imagination. And it's amazing. So, so right now you are talking about the what you like about George R. R. Martin. For me, it's the incredible metaphors and the the rich language of the characters. And I was trying to remember a a half remembered phrase used to describe someone's singing voice. And I remember it was like "Honey poured over thunder" or something like that. So I started to type in "Honey, uh, Honey poured over thunder." And let me actually type it here: "Poured over thunder." And it start and it auto completed. Uh, the whole phrase, so enough other people remembered it. But uh, but this, there you go, uh, Darion on uh, Song of Ice and Fire. Eamon describes his voice as honey poured over thunder. It's it's amazing. His writing is impeccable. It's so seductive, and you get sucked all the way in. We got one more email from but Darren. It's also here, real quick. I was, I was hanging out with Brian last week, and I made a really 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 crude joke uh, about swords, and it's it's remarkable how much. That George can go, I call him George because you know we're on like a first name basis. Um, <laughs> where he can go from like that that awesome, amazing prose to like 
the most like down and dirty base, like disgusting kind of uh, reference uh, using whatever colloquialisms are appropriate to the scene and everything flows. He just, he writes in a universe that is just so his. Yes. Well, it is. It's, it is. it's a filthy, filthy world. Darren Best writes us, uh, guys, regarding the discussion about Ultraviolet and Justin's rant that Paramount and other studios are stupid, and that's why their attempts at online distribution is failing, I beg to differ. The studios know exactly what they're doing. They're attempting to make a legitimate online distribution service, but doing it in a way that is supposed to fail. While the DRM is advertised to be easy to use for multiple devices, there will be significant hiccups to accidentally annoy a large number of users, combined with making the prices higher than Blu-ray, this is a recipe for rejection in the marketplace. Then the studios can cry to Congress about how they tried to do business online to compete with fire share, to compete with fire share, sharing, file sharing. He, there's, there's a misspell here. But those blasted kids on the internet only want stuff for free. So damn it, we need SOPA slash PIPA slash whatever comes next. Maybe I'm being too conspiratorial, but it seems to me that the studios are more than willing to sacrifice a ton of money trying to demonstrate why they should be allowed to demand that the internet be neutered in order to preserve the business model of shipping plastic discs instead of competing with the downloading or streaming services legal or otherwise. What do you say to that, Justin Robert Young? Uh, Darren Best, you're the Darren Worst. Um, <laughs> no, no, they're 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 scared slash incompetent. It's not a conspiracy, okay? That I, I I cannot I I you know maybe okay yes there's theoretically they could it's not though no. and don't think it is because it's not and uh this is a pattern of dumb behavior by them you know there's just a lot of evidence of them not understanding how to do stuff and doing it completely the wrong way and this is just another example of it and uh, you know i'll tell you if they were smart enough to manipulate things like this they'd be smart enough to do it right which they're not it's harder for them to go through this crazy machiavellian game of thrones scheme yes the ceo cersei lannister is figuring out how to manipulate Congress and and ram through this legislation. That's not how they work. They they get legislation through by hard lobbying and and you know making their case. They don't need to gild the lily. This would be what what he's describing here. Uh, Darren, thank you for writing in. But since it's not my show, I can call you an idiot and and you can blame Tom. <laughs> All right, guys, that is it for this episode. Write us at frameratio at gmail.com. Get us your thoughts and questions. We'll see you guys next week on Frame Rate.